Hello everyone, welcome to our Public Health Plus series. Today, we're going to be talking about environmental justice. My name is Michelle James, as Diego mentioned, and I am the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement for the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University here in Atlanta, Georgia. Public health touches nearly every aspect of our world, as is becoming more and more clear every day, especially given our current pandemic. It is at these intersections of public health and communications, design, business, social justice, et cetera, that we find the most potential for growth as individuals and as a society. The series was created by the Rollins School of Public Health Alumni Board Career Development Committee in partnership with our amazing friends at Orange Sparkle Ball to examine the spaces where public health intersects with other disciplines, discuss the work and broaden our thinking. We are honored today to have Dr. Natasha Desjarnet with us to share her experience and expertise and Sophie Becker facilitating our discussion. Together, we'll discuss the overlap of climate and health and how these issues affect our world today. Sophie is a design strategist at Orange Sparkle Ball and she joined their team after graduating from Rochester Institute of Technology with a BFA in industrial design and a minor in psychology. Her passion for social impact design brought her to the agency and further strategy and communication network focused projects have allowed her to develop her human centric design and innovation strategy skill set. Thankfully for us, public health recently captured her interest as she has begun helping to lead this series for us. She's previously worked in marketing, graphic design, and traditional industrial design. And with a little bit of luck, we might get her back to pursue a master's of public health degree in the future. Dr. Dejanet is an assistant professor in the Christina Lee Brown Environ Institute at the University of Louisville's Division of Environmental Medicine. That's a mouthful. She is also a professional lecturer in environmental and occupational health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, one of our peer institutions. Prior to becoming an assistant professor, she was an interim associate director of program and partnership development at the National Environmental Health Association. There, she led areas of research, climate and health, as well as children's environmental health. She also previously served as a policy analyst at the American Public Health Association, where she led the NAC natural environment portfolio, including air and water exposures, along with climate change. She is a member of the EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, the governing board of the Citizens Climate Education, the Board of Directors for Physicians for Social Responsibility, Special Advisor to the Environmental Health Coalition, and the Steering Committee of the International Transformational Resilience Coalition. She has many, many, many more accolades, but I don't want to take up too much time. I want to give plenty of time for discussion and exploration into today's topic, public health plus environmental justice. So with that, Sophie, Dr. Dejanet, I give it to you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you to the rest of the Public Health Planning Committee. We couldn't have done it without you. Dr. Dejanet, we are so excited and honored to have you with us today. Um, I know you mentioned that you might be having some environmental noise in your background. I hope that is clearing up. Um, but let's get into it. We would love to hear about what your background is, what got you into public health, and um, what you're currently working on. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I am deeply honored to be here, grateful for this opportunity, looking forward to the discussion with you and question and answer from the group later. Uh, so I, I'll step very briefly through um, my work history, and then I'll also tell you a personal story of kind of what drove my passion um, within environmental health. So with that, I'm going to share screen. So here's a timeline, and I, I, I should take the dates off of this timeline. <laughs> this is, uh, but th this, this shows kind of a snapshot over the course of my career and education. And so um, in undergraduate, I studied biology and chemistry. I was pre-med um, with interest in being a pediatrician. Uh, over time, my connection to medicine 
uh, wasn't there. Uh, the connection was, uh, I was beginning to lose it. I didn't understand what that meant because I clearly cared about health and I cared about well-being and quality of life. And this disconnection with medicine was, was a bit confusing for me. Uh, but in the meantime, I utilized my chemistry degree and I went to become a chemical technician at Lexmark. And this started my research career. I worked in research and development there for a few years. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. But what I did while I was there was I knew I still had a commitment to health. And so I started volunteering. And that allowed me to meet somebody that's in public health. And that opened my mind to, oh, let's see what public health is. And of course, it was a perfect fit for me. Um, so first recommendation, volunteer. That, that really helps you um, not only to give back, but also to find out much more. Uh, so I uh, went to University of Louisville to pursue my master in public health. I found the environment um, concentration, and it was environmental health was the perfect fit, the missing link. And I had a, a really great experience, so great that uh, I stayed to pursue my PhD at University of Louisville, um, again, concentrating in environmental health. And my dissertation research was on air quality and cardiovascular disease risk. And I also stayed at University of Louisville to pursue my postdoctoral training, which I also concentrated in environmental cardiology, more in the environmental epidemiology side um, of environmental health and uh, worked on a very large um, foundational study that looked at air pollution levels in Louisville uh, and paired that with heart disease risk factors in the population uh, of the city. So really great experiences. From there, I went to the American Public Health Association where my understanding and environmental health was laser focused on environmental cardiology there i got to really expand so i led the natural environment portfolio which included air water and climate change and it was a it was a nice bridge uh, but it was an exciting time to be in climate change the pope had just released his encyclical tying faith um, to a moral responsibility um, to act on climate change and the, that was the first thing. And then there were just um, a lot of things that happened after that. The US Climate and Health Assessment, the National Climate and Health, the National Climate Assessment, so many things were happening at that time that climate change became most of the natural environment portfolio, where it was a little bit more evenly split between air, water, climate change. Climate change became a majority of the portfolio. And at the point that I left, we actually established APHA's Center for Climate Health and Equity. That's how much it grew during that time. So, uh, and certainly leading to that. So very exciting, but it, it developed my roots in climate and health and I, I couldn't be more grateful. I went on to the National Environmental Health Association there to lead research and as well as climate and health and children's environmental health uh, also a really exciting time to ensure that the voice of the environmental health workforce was reflected in climate decisions and recommendations that were being made. Uh, while I was at NEHA, I began teaching at George Washington University. I absolutely love having the opportunity to share unsolicited advice and mentor students. <laughs> and also um, our course is Environmental and Biological Foundations in Public Health. And so for the master's program, it's their first exposure to environmental health. And I love having, uh, being able to be that bridge to, um, to help students to understand the role of environmental health and the connection in public health. And that's been really exciting and quite rewarding. And I think that directly led to where I am now at University of Louisville. I just started in October. And I'm an assistant professor in environmental medicine. Um, and we are home to the Environ Institute. And uh, it, it's been quite exciting. And here I've been developing a research program around climate and health and also doing work around environmental health disparities. Uh, but to give you just a little bit more background on the uh, what brought me here, I've been asked a lot what led me on this path. And it, it really goes back to my childhood. I am a child of the Great Migration, meaning that my parents grew up in the Jim Crow South. 
uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and moved to points north to find more opportunities. So I grew up in Kentucky. So my return to Louisville is a return home. Uh, but the people of the Great Migration, they work really hard to keep close ties with the family back home. So calling, visiting as often as they can, but also they want to make sure that their children have very strong bonds with their family, even though they're far away. So me, I spent a lot of time in Birmingham as a child. Summers, breaks, holidays. I got to play with my cousins and here they are in these pictures. If you're wondering who I am, I am the child that is not looking at the camera in either photo. I am wearing a blue, dress, a blue tie in one photo and a red plaid dress in the other. But you can see from the photos, we had so much fun running, playing, not a care in the world. Except I did have one care. I noticed at an early age that my well-controlled asthma would often flare up when I visited Birmingham. Uh, and so when I got into graduate school, uh, th so this bothered me for quite some time and I just, why can't I breathe when I'm there? But you, you know, you just live with it. You pack extra medication and that's what I did um, all my life. But when I got into graduate school, I was given the opportunity to do a community health assessment on any community in the US. I said, let's find out what's going on in North Birmingham, Alabama, where my parents grew up. Why can't I breathe when I'm there? And uh, what I found out was that the North Birmingham community where my parents were from was home to numerous hazardous facilities. Um, and you know, it's not necessarily a matter of choice uh, because when my grandparents purchased their home, they were subject to redlining. So they didn't have a choice on what they or their families were exposed to. Um, but taking it a step further, I also found out that this community was riddled with numerous health disparities, present day, low birth weight, cardiovascular disease, other chronic conditions. So what I found out was that the place where my family was raised, um, still faces health impacts because of environmental injustices uh, that persisted over decades. Through this, I found the root of my passion in environmental health. Um, the connection to justice within environmental health I found to be my calling. Um, and at the time, I said, this is my call to be a voice for the voiceless. I don't feel that way right now. Um, currently, I feel that I have opportunities to give voice to the voiceless, to ensure that there's a seat at the table for the voice, um, for the voices of the traditionally voiceless to be able to raise their concerns and stand in their own expertise, their lived experiences of what they're exposed to. But I just wanted to share with you a little bit of background on um, the why behind it all for me. So thank you. And thanks for that great question. That is such a powerful story. And you, you answered my next question, which was, what, is, what are you most passionate about? And what do you wish you could talk about that you don't always get the chance to? Um, Absolutely. It's justice. It, it's definitely justice. Um, I have found health and climate change to be top of mind for me. Once I found that space in the field, as long as I can contribute and have something meaningful to contribute in the health impacts of climate change, I, I find great reward in that. But it's the justice that underscores it that is quite important. So certain populations that have added burden, like people of color, children, older adults, tribal communities, climate change is a threat multiplier for them. And so to be able to not just look at the different ways that we can adapt or mitigate, but to also look at to ensure that all populations will benefit is quite important. Because as we know, climate change is the greatest threat to human health that we face. And I've heard executive directors, Dr. Georges Benjamin of APHA say this and affirm this, um, Dr. David Dijak of the National Environmental Health Association and many other health leaders say and affirm this. Uh, but within that, there's also a justice component not just here in the US, but globally, that also we need to take into account. Definitely. Um, so this last year is kind of the combination of all the intersections of your work uh, we have seen. We are still living through um, a global pandemic. We have seen incredible movement around the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we've seen unprecedented environmental health um, catastrophes out here in the West. We're having historical wildfires, we're having hurricanes and so many other issues. 
how has that affected your work and um, how do you foresee it affecting the future of your work? Well, thank you for asking this. Um, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. There, there are unprecedented um, concurrent emergencies that we've been experiencing. COVID, first and foremost, has resulted in nearly 400,000 deaths here in the U.S. Um, significantly affected health globally as well, and also the U.S. economy. What's affected health has also affected the economy here, and certainly that, that's not lost on any of us. Uh, so that's our, our first uh, concurrent emergency. Second, climate change. It's still happening. We have a record, we had a record breaking number of extreme heat events um, here in the U.S. and cer in certain parts of the U.S. last summer. Also, we had hurricane season last summer that, that brought a record breaking number of storms to make landfall that also confounded our pandemic response. And then we also had a wildfire season that was largely unprecedented. Um, I've read stats that the acreage that was burned in 2020 was nearly double that of the acreage burned in the previous wildfire season, also confounding um, or exacerbating, potentially exacerbating pandemic response. Each of those expose injustices. Certainly COVID laid bare health disparities in the US, but climate events also laid bare health disparities when we look at the recovery from extreme storms, the mortality and beyond. But we also experienced those two concurrent disasters as we're in the midst of the racial reckoning and the global response to the deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Amart Aubrey and others. I appreciate where we are in the racial reckoning right now. I feel that there's much opportunity. I feel that the dialogue on this has been, um, it, it has potential to lead to more change than the dialogue had been as of late. And it feels like more people are beginning to see what families that look like my family um, have been experiencing and are understanding of the injustice of it and not accepting of the injustice of it. Um, even in a professional setting, I feel that the burden of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, have, it's, it's often been a burden on these populations to bring up issues of injustice. And you, you think as you go into meetings, okay, uh, let's make sure that what, what decisions are being made, that equity is being included in it or has someone thought about how this affects that population? And I feel that more people than Black, Indigenous, and people of color are speaking up and, and asking these questions um, in meetings as of late. So I think there's great opportunity here. And I hope that continues to change and shape um, my work, but as well as the work of the field of public health and the work of the field of environmental health. Um, so when it comes to what we can learn from COVID and the racial reckoning, we need to shift understanding um, in terms of climate change that we're all at risk to the health threats of climate change, but that there are some populations and some communities that are more at risk and, and have been for quite a while. Climate change, as I said, is a threat multiplier for these communities. So helping those that bear the greatest burden actually benefits everyone and ensuring that climate action and policy measures will benefit the health of our most burdened will ensure that we'll all benefit. So this, uh, this is absolutely, I think, a great opportunity. And I think that uh, despite um, the unfortunate circumstances that we are in, I do feel like there's more opportunity and more promise that there will be change. That's always a little hopeful to hear that. Thank you. Um, so speaking of the future, um, the area you work in is very heavy, very urgent. How do you balance the reality of that while keeping hope and looking forward to the future? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I actually um, thrive in diagnosing uh, a situation and understanding the impacts and the threats. I, have been criticized, however, for depressing people 
people with facts and figures uh, where that inspires me, that motivates me. Um, eco grief is real. Um, and we, you know, we talk about that in environmental health and in climate change where knowing uh, the burden of what's happening around us or the future of what that may look like um, can be quite a burden. Um, so I am working to do a better job of depressing people less uh, by incorporating storytelling, sharing successes that are in the field rather than focusing um, as much on the negative. So I'm taking, so to balance uh, the weight and the hope, I'm also working to make sure that what I share with certain audiences, because you have to know your audience, but certain audience doesn't uh, simply depress them. Um, but also I'm engaging in uh, working with people towards a shared vision of what a better future could look like. This can help motivate action. So um, say, asking people, what makes you hopeful? Asking what the vision of the future is, and then allowing um, ourselves to collectively work towards what that is, because there, there are always things that are in common whether it's equity, whether it's economic prosperity, whether it's a clean, healthy earth, um, it's connected. And so finding these connections um, can also help build hope in others. Um, so there's a podcast episode that I did for um, Citizens Climate Radio earlier this year. And I, I talked with a host about it recently and he said it has been one of his most popular shows and that he's gotten more comments on that show than many others. And it was right at the start of the pandemic. Now the show is on climate change, but he asked people to share their vision for the future. And in all these shared visions, it gave people hope um, on a challenging subject in a challenging time. So I think, I think we can all learn from this um, to envision what a, what a better future looks like. Um, or, or what we want the future to look like, and then use that to help guide our decision making. I'm so glad you mentioned that episode. Um, when I was preparing for this conversation, I listened to it, and it was just one of the most inspiring things I've listened to as of late. Um, and I really recommend everyone to go and listen to it. Oh, I'm have. so glad you said that. Thank you for validating that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so keeping with our thought of the future, so much around the messaging around climate change is so forward thinking, especially for privileged communities. We think about climate change as a future issue. How can we change the messaging to help people understand that climate change is happening now? And for many communities, it has been happening for a long time. Absolutely. This is a challenge because when um, Eco America releases an American Climate Metrics Survey, and there are often results that show that people do acknowledge that climate change is real, and that number of people is growing. So that's good. Uh, but there are many that also still see it as something that's far off in the future. And um, whether it is, whether you believe it is far off in the future, or that, or you know that it is happening now, it's not really an either or. It, the time is now to do something about that. Um, by addressing the issues that are that we are experiencing now with climate change, we can prevent, we can work now to prevent long term more devastating consequences. Now, it's really hard to motivate people um, in that way, but that is the reality that we're in. Climate change is now and it is real. Now, I think that is something that we can convey better, being that there are many that believe that yeah, so, okay, it's real, but we're not gonna feel the, the impacts much until further down the line. No, we're actually feeling them now. Um, so we need to convey things, for example, that it is our responsibility to the next generation to leave them a future where they can grow healthy and thrive. Um, and not only do we owe that to the next generation, they're actually demanding it. Um, and, and I love this. I, the young leaders, especially last year and the year before that came together, they've been um, speaking to policymakers, they've been on the Hill, they have 
been on TV. They have commanded the media. Greta and, um, and all the young leaders that are out there are calling on decision makers to act now, whether or not we're raising our voices as we should be. They're, they're stepping in. So the future generations are demanding this, and we do owe it to the next generation. But in terms of how we communicate this better, I always go back to the wise words of Dr. Ed Maybach um, at George Mason University. The uh, climate communicator extraordinaire uh, that climate change, he has a mantra, it's three parts. Climate change is real, it's happening now, and there's much that we can do about it. And so if those of us that are in the field can unify our language in certain ways, like climate change is real, it's happening now, and there's much we can do about it, it's on the different sectors uh, to speak to the much that we can do about it. We could tailor that to the ways that we can contribute to doing something about it. But if we can have some unified language, uh, that's very helpful. What concerns me is that what we're experiencing now um, was estimated through scientists many years ago. When I started at the American Public Health Association, I found out about um, the APHA's Climate, Public Health Climatology Committee. And that committee published reports in 1923 and 1926 explaining that climate change is a health issue. So the health impacts that they noted in 1923, nearly 100 years ago, are the health impacts that we're experiencing now. So we've known about this for quite some time. Um, so when we're talking about this being far off in the future, in 1923, the science told us what was happening. So it's happening now. Um, but then another thing that I think needs to be communicated and communicating that this is real, this is happening now, that also cer certain communities are more at risk than others. Um, I know, I think I have said this over and over, I can't say it enough, um, but I think to the words of Peterson Toscano, host of Citizens Climate Radio. And what he says is that we are all in the same boat, but we're not on the same deck. So while climate affects all of our health and it puts all of our health at risk, there are certain people that bear higher risk. Um, and I think it's also important that as we're working towards climate action, that yes, we're motivated by children, um, or motivated by the next generation, but also we need to be motivated by there are certain communities that bear a greater burden that also happen to contribute much less um, when it comes to the climate catastrophe. Continuing off that, um, what kind of messaging do you find the most impactful? I know you mentioned that we need to really tailor the message, but do you find it more impactful to use kind of a moral reasoning? I know you mentioned the Pope and how when we got religion involved, that was very impactful. Um, do you find personal arguments, economic arguments, or scientific arguments? Um, what do you find the best? My answer is yes. <laughs> yes, all. Uh, I think that we need different approaches for different people. Um, I will say that I think we need to shift away from polar bears being the poster child of climate change. Polar bears are very important um, and, and they have been a canary um, in the mind that have given us a clue that something is not going right. But I think we have missed the mark in making the polar bear the poster child in the face of climate change because um, it affects human health as well. And I think our children, next generation, my grandma, other people that are uniquely burdened by climate change, I think that needs to be the face of, of climate change and, and the face that motivates us to act. Um, but in terms of how we communicate this, it, it really is different approaches for different people. Um, the, for the moral imperative to act, the religious angle, um, the Pope's messaging was quite powerful. I recall vividly when he released the encyclical because I'm a person of faith. And so it meant the world to hear that argument from the faith side. And I'm sure many others um, within that were um, maybe even exposed to something that they hadn't taken account of before. Um, so I think the moral angle, angle is quite important. Now then there's data. Uh, I think the data angle works quite well for scientists. Those scientists overwhelmingly agree that climate change is real and happening now. 
Uh, data works very well in this audience. I would not say data works well on all audience. I think, uh, I think the saying might be that data bores and stories soar. Uh, but if you're working with an audience um, that is motivated by data, that can be quite helpful. Um, science is important. And I think uh, as we go through this pandemic, we can't emphasize that enough, the importance and the urgent, urgency um, of science and co contributing to science. It's beyond important, it's essential. Um, however, as I said, not all audiences are moved by data. So I think that we also need to focus in on storytelling um, to bring people into the dialogue. This might be it. Data may eventually, um, we need data to inform decision-making. Uh, and once we have, told a story that really helps connect people, then data might be the next step. But uh, I can't emphasize success stories enough. First, um, I'm sorry, I can't emphasize storytelling enough. Success stories need to be shared. We don't do that enough in public health. And in fact, in public health, we have a tendency to focus on the 1% that didn't go our way compared to the 99% that did. We've got to share our successes much better than we do. For example, if you talk to people that spend a lot of time in climate change, you will think that our air quality is getting worse, where actually our air quality has improved greatly since the Clean Air Act, since the 1970s, our air quality has greatly improved. And this has been tied to improved health outcomes. We don't share those successes. Um, and that is because we have yet to find a safe level of um, many air pollutants. We, we don't know a safe level. So, continued improvement is needed. Um, but we can do a better job of telling these stories. Also, physicians can share stories of their patients, trends that they're seeing in their clinics. I like to share about the Green Heart Study in Louisville because I think this is something that's tangible that other cities may be able to take on um, and tailor to their needs. Uh, the Green Heart Study, um, we do this through the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute, and it's funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, or NIEHS, and the Nature Conservancy. And essentially, we're planting trees for healthier air. So we look at heart disease risk before planting the trees. Um, planting the trees uh, is hypothesized to reduce the air pollutants. Um, but also we want to see if this has positive cardiovascular health outcomes. So after planting the trees, we come back and we continue looking at the population's cardiovascular health risk. Um, so this is repeatable, it's adaptable, and can be quite effective and tangible for other cities. So telling stories um, can really help be that bridge between the data. It can pull in the moral side, depending on uh, who you're sharing with. But I think we've just got to do a much better job of storytelling, and we've got to do a much better job of uh, sharing our successes. So overall, but I think the, the key is to understand your audience, and that will help change the discourse and the dialogue of climate change and health communications. Not to uh, have us focus on a disaster story yet again, but do you think there are any major lessons that you didn't already outline um, that we can learn from COVID and our messaging around that and apply it to environmental health? I think that is what we should continue um, looking at. There's always something that you can learn. And certainly in COVID, there's much that we can then learn and apply it to climate. Um, I think that much of the time, public health leaders, as well as environmental health leaders and beyond, are great at talking to each other, but are not necessarily great at sharing in a way that we can have a wider reach, that we can speak with the general public and beyond. Um, I think one thing that we have learned in COVID communications and beyond is that if just if we ignore health disparities or we don't take account for health disparities, that does not mean that they go away um, and they may be further exacerbated. Um, that, you know, that was uncovered in COVID. That also is uncovered in climate and other aspects of environmental health as well. And that's something that we need to keep in mind as we discuss vaccine distribution. Um, but communication is 
key. And I think that we've seen that from the start of COVID. Uh, communication is absolutely critical. For example, the messaging around the mask. I will not get into the weeds here, uh, but making sure that we frame um, such messaging uh, in terms of values, for example, um, the value of protecting others, uh, that may be helpful. There are com I'm not a communications expert. There are communications experts that find that um, speaking in terms of values may work better with certain audiences, but we may need the audience specific um, audience specific dialogue that really helps with the communication. Also having the right messenger assists with communication. Um, nurses are known to be the most trusted professionals, not just the most trusted health professionals, they're the most trusted professionals. So in, ensuring that we are utilizing the right key messengers that are trusted, that are valued, also quite important. Um, it, it, this may require systems change, this may require generations to change, but um, thinking more collectively, thinking about the health of society and health of the world and our responsibility in that, rather than thinking more individually, um, or finding out which populations think more on an individual level and less on a societal level and how to better communicate our responsibilities and how to protect our health um, therein. But I think that another key message um, that we need to learn from COVID-19 is that science is essential. Science is, science is science. It, it's hard for me to put words around the necessity and the urgency and the importance of science, but, but it is essential and it's valued. And this, maybe because uh, all of us, I'm sure this is what we have worked towards. Um, we're in a scientific field, uh, but, uh, similarly, the value of public health um, can also be emphasized in communication. People see the value of public health when there's a pressing emergency, like a pandemic. Um, and the same is true of climate change. Um, people, you know, when there is a climate event, like a hurricane, like a wildfire, that does pique people's interest in terms of, okay, climate change. Uh, but we need to be able to drive that same urgency of dialogue outside of a pandemic, outside of a climate event, um, more towards proactive dialogue um, around preparedness. And um, another thing I think from the communications is that what happens in other countries affects us. And we should not think of ourselves as being outside of what happens somewhere else or not susceptible to what happens somewhere else or not able to contribute to what happens somewhere else. I think it is important that we look and see what is happening in other countries and not think that this is, uh, that this has no effect or that we have no responsibility there. Um, and you can, uh, COVID I think is an obvious example, but you can also look to that in terms of different aspects of climate, uh, where there's drought in other countries, where this is causing forced migration and conflict. Uh, there's much that can be learned um, and there's much that can be communicated better from that. Uh, but ultimately, once again, the polar bear is not necessarily the accurate uh, poster child for climate change, not the accurate base of climate change. And, uh, and, and we can seek to find better uh, there. But I, I want to also give you encouragement, I'm, I'm sorry, more accurate. Uh, but I, I want to give you some encouragement because I've been told that I'm Debbie Downer and I admitted that to you before. Um, there is evidence that perceptions are changing. So what we're doing is working. You know, we're, we're in the marathon. We're not in the sprint. Um, although we know that the urgency is here, it's now. Um, but there is an increasing number of people that do acknowledge that climate change is real and that are even connecting it to health. Everything you just said was incredible and uh, everyone should have written all that down. <laughs> um, shifting gears just a little bit, I do know we are approaching our Q&A session, um, so I want to squeeze in just a few more things. We have been talking about health outcomes very much so in the terms of the physical world. Um, how do you think the conversation should shift to help us think more about mental health consequences and that aspect of public health and environmental? Issues. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really glad that, that you brought that into the dialogue. It is, 
it is vital that we not only focus on the physical health impacts, but also the mental health impacts of both COVID and climate and environmental exposures. Uh, COVID is certainly showing itself to be, um, to, to have a great impact on mental health. Our physical distancing, um, we, in, in fact, we had to, not had to, but we realize it's a bit of a misnomer to say social distancing because we want people to remain socially engaged, but to do that physically. Um, because without that, that does have impacts on our mental wellness and well-being. Uh, so we, we ignore um, or don't bring mental health into the dialogue at our own peril. Uh, that there's evidence. Um, certainly on the mental health threats of climate change. And it's largely, there's a lot of evidence that's out there in terms of exposure to extreme weather, but it comes a bit slowly. Um, so there's a lot of data that's out there on Hurricane Katrina. There's information that one in six people that survived Hurricane Katrina developed a post-traumatic stress disorder afterwards. That 49%, nearly half of survivors developed an anxiety or mood disorder and that suicide or suicidal ideation doubled following Hurricane Katrina. Uh, that information is there and accessible, but it's a bit slower um, coming out of more recent storms like Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Harvey. Um, so increased funding and support for research in this area uh, would be ultimately um, quite helpful. But that's a challenge where I, I was actually just listening to um, local public radio uh, last night and they had a spotlight on mental health and they were sharing that over the years funding for mental health services has decreased. There was some funding that came through um, COVID uh, supplemental funding um, that that actually might allow them to be able to accomplish now what's needed. They hope that that will turn into more funding in the future, uh, but that has been a challenge and certainly been a challenge in the research space as well. Um, but the events that affect our physical health and threaten our physical health also have an impact um, on our mental health. And it's not only the natural disasters. Um, you may also consider events that affect our economy and jobs. Uh, that weighs very heavily on the minds of many, certainly with COVID, but even there's an example from the mid 80s. As I said, there is, <laughs> there's, there's a lag time in, in publishing certain things. Um, in the mid 80s, there was a, um, a drought that occurred in the upper Midwest. This was linked with a, a doubling of the suicide rate in that time. And they were looking specifically at farmers and over 900 farmers in the upper Midwest um, are, are linked in this, in this suicide rate. So ensuring that we're not overlooking mental health, that we're keeping mental health in dialogue and also ensuring um, or advocating for or supporting funding uh, within this area would be um, imperative. I do want to bring in um, a few questions we are receiving. I'm going to link one from Tatiana Gonzalez. She asks, how do we know where to begin um, in terms of taking action now? Um, I also want to tie that into what kind of advice do you have for the general public, uh, for students, since I know we have a few on the call, and also public health professionals and other professionals? Absolutely. I. I'll, I'll start with students. I think there's much that students can do. And, I, and, and as was the case for me, doing these things really exposes you to a much wider world and helps you to uh, find many ways that you can contribute to making a difference. So for me as a student, one of the best things that I did was getting engaged with professional associations. So I became a member of American Public Health Association while I was a student. It's a long and wonderful story, but I'll skip, I'll skip the details in the interest of time. It led to me getting a job. Now, I'm not saying that, that every organization you join, you're going to end up working for, but what it did was it allowed me to be in the place where people were talking about job opportunities um, and where people got to see that, that I contribute. So I would highly, 
highly encourage getting involved with professional organizations. Often schools have funds that are set aside to support um, uh, leadership development in students. Um, so as you join these organizations, don't just join, but do get involved. So join committees, um, take advantage of networking opportunities. That's hard for me to say. I'm, I'm actually, a, I don't enjoy, <laughs> I don't enjoy intentional networking, but, uh, but it, it does make a difference if you, if you network passively or if you network actively, these types of organizations give you those opportunities. And then also engage. So don't just stay silent, be an active participant. And I think, I think that made all the difference for me and I'm sure that that makes all the difference for many. Um, because they're large organizations. APHA has um, 50,000 members. <laughs> there are 11 to 13,000 that attend their annual conference each year. So it's easy to get there and just disappear. But don't do that. Engage and get involved. And, um, and I think you will, will reap many, many benefits. Also, something that I did as a student was I volunteered. Uh, there were some aspects of uh, environmental health that I wanted to be engaged in that weren't possible through my coursework. Um, so when I became a postdoc at University of Louisville, I joined the local environmental justice team. There's an environmental justice um, community in Louisville called Rubbertown, and so I joined the Rubbertown Environmental Action Team, REACT, and was able to learn, understand, hear directly from community members, and do, you know, uh, contribute my uh, academic, uh, academic connections and beyond to help the community. So those are recommendations I give to students for the general public. I actually have similar advice, get engaged, find people with a shared interest and passion. I think that we can do more um, as a collective in numbers than we're able to accomplish individually. So find folks that have that shared interest and passion in the area that you have. Find grassroots organizations in your community. I personally belong to several and, and it's exciting when, when you all share the same mission and are going and trying to do something to make a difference. Um, and then also, I think that we all have a responsibility to educate ourselves. Uh, like I said, be careful, don't fall into the place of um, eco grief or otherwise, but I think that educating yourself through reputable sources can only empower you further. Going back a little bit in the chat, we have a great question from Isabel. She asks, I see little action on the part of healthcare providers towards environmental health. What can health systems do? Oh, wow. Well. Oh, there's so much. I can't give you specifics, but I have um, I have great respect for healthcare without harm, and healthcare without harm has uh, they have a they have something called Project Green Health, which actually has um, recommendations for what health systems can do because health systems do contribute to climate change. They're a significant contributor to uh, global emissions. So being, and their health systems, um, there are model health systems, I think Kaiser, um, uh, Gunderson Health, uh, there, there are some model health systems that other health systems can look to as examples, but I definitely would start with looking to um, Healthcare Without Harm and looking to their Project Green Health, and they have tons of um, advice, activities, actions, and toolkits for health systems. Perfect. Margaret Horton also asks, any idea on how to communicate assets and strengths of a community that is vulnerable to the effects of climate change? It's a great question. I think that's a great question, Margaret. And I think that the way you have framed this is the way the field needs to go. I, I hesitate to even use the words vulnerable because uh, environmental justice communities have said we're not vulnerable, we are resilient. We have been making a way out of no way for generations and generations. Um, so to be able to tap into the assets and the strengths of the community, I think is the direction that we need to shift away, uh, shift. And in doing this, I think that we need meaningful engagement with community members. Uh, and that's not always the norm, though it's a lot of what we preach, but it's still not always the norm to make sure community members are there at the table contributing their lived and understood expertise. Uh, but ensuring that the community is able 
um, to be meaningfully involved, that you have the right participants within the community, that you also have trusted messengers engaged within the community, and that you're listening to the community. Um, there, there have I've heard community members complain. Yes, they held a um, they held a a listening session, but they just talked at us the whole time. Uh, there are models that are out there so that we are not just um, talking at people the whole time, but we're actually listening and engaging together. And we have another great question from Tatiana Gonzalez. She asks, do you think mental health and wellness hold a differentiation and perception towards climate change acceptance and awareness? Wow, that is a that is an interesting and in-depth question. There certainly is the stigma with mental health that that's still there that we're still working to overcome. Um, but in addition to that, uh, there, there's stigma with climate change as well. So th there's there's a lot of perceptions to be able to overcome. But it is it is urgently important that climate is a part of the dialogue um, for mental health. Um, and that mental health is a dialogue that is kept in context of all environmental health um, and public health exposures. And uh, lastly, I have one last question for you. Um, what kind of uh, podcasts or media, any books you could recommend to all of us to learn more about environmental health? Absolutely. I, I would highly recommend What the Eyes Don't See a Story of Crisis, Resistance, and Hope in an American City by Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. I, that book has actually been out for quite some time, but during the pandemic, I have engaged in a lot of audiobooks. I listened to it, and to hear her voice narrate her story was so impactful, but it, 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 I think there are lessons in that story that can apply to so many other crises that we face, so I highly recommend that. Also, many podcasts, we have talked about Citizens Climate Radio, hosted by Peterson Toscano, I highly recommend. Also, Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio um, really applies more broadly across environmental health. I think in December, climate change was their theme. Um, they, they produce weekly. Um, also, if you just have a little time, Yale Climate Connections radio programs, their, their radio stories are two minutes or less, I believe, so they're really quick. And then also America Adapts. It is about climate change. It goes beyond health, but to further expose yourself to what people are doing to adapt to climate change, I highly recommend them as well. Thank you. And thank you for sharing the link. Yeah. I, I know the first time you mentioned that book to me, I, I didn't get the whole title down, so it took me a little Googling to find it, but I want to make sure everyone um, can check out those resources because they are great. And this is a topic that, like you mentioned, we need to continue educating ourselves on. Absolutely. Um, we are almost at time, so I just want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about all of this. This was very eye-opening, and I hope everyone learned something and can't thank you enough. I will hand it back over to Michelle and um, Diego will be breaking us out into discussion groups so we can further dive into these topics. Thank you so much. And I hope your discussion groups have great dialogue today. Thanks.